have always longed to fly like the birds and join the creatures that defy gravity to soar effortlessly overhead. Flight is the loftiest of all our dreams in myth and magic. We fly in war and in peace. The story of humans' conquest of the air spans the centuries. The first solid expression of the longing for flight was probably the kite flown in China as early as 2000 BC. Many thought the paper creation was too dangerous. It might lift people off the ground. And indeed, in one Japanese story, a samurai warrior trapped in exile sent his son aloft on a kite. The boy flew to freedom. Many inventors have toyed with man-lifting kites. Some of the contraptions saw duty in the First World War, when they were used for observing the enemy. In fact, for centuries, kites were the only way for humans to lift off the ground and join the birds. For a bird, even a baby bird, flight comes naturally. A baby dove just two and a half weeks old will soon be testing its tiny wings. In a few weeks, it will be ready for flight, sustained and controlled movement through the air. A drifting feather is not capable of true flight, not without its owner, but it does reveal the substance on which all flight rides, air. Earth's atmosphere is a thick blanket reaching up for many miles. Evolution has taken advantage of this perfect, if invisible, medium for travel. Three hundred million years before the first humans, the air was already alive with wing beats, mayflies, cockroaches, and dragonflies, with wingspans as long as a human arm. Life on the wing brought a huge advantage. It made for fast escapes and the ability to fly far and wide in the search for food. Later, pterosaurs cruised the ancient skies, like prehistoric hang gliders. And then from the same evolutionary flight path as these flying dinosaurs came the first birds with their far more complex wings. Later came yet more insects and even flying mammals, bats. But it was the birds that humans dreamt of following up into the sky. Could a man fly like a bird? In Greek legend, two men did. Escaping captivity from a royal castle, Daedalus and his son Icarus soared from their imprisonment on wings of wax and feathers. Icarus, in his excitement, flew too high. In the words of the poet Ovid, the softening wax that fell to nearer sun dissolved apace and soon began to run. Icarus fell into the sea and a dream ground with him. The Egyptian goddess Isis could fly like a bird. For ancient Egyptians, flight was the pathway to heaven. The Ba, a hawk with a human head, symbolized the soul's flight from the grave. Wings upon a human form conferred an angelic existence. Legend also tells of attempts to harness real winged creatures. A Persian king is said to have tethered starving eagles to his throne. He induced them upwards by tempting them with meat. The legend says it worked for a moment. Shish kebab proved a poor means of fueling human flight. If we couldn't harness the birds, at least we could observe and study them. More than 9,000 species of birds could fly, so surely we could too. Around 1000 AD, Elmer, an English monk, built himself some wings. He launched himself from the monastery wall, but 
that there were to be no flying monks. Elmer broke both of his legs in the fall and was lame forever after. Others tried too. Medieval tower jumpers persistent in the belief that they could fly. Some questionable claims of success survive to this day. Even a natural born flyer must master two skills at once, generating forward motion or thrust and upward motion or lift. It takes wings to generate that lift and thrust, streamlining to overcome air resistance and muscle power to propel the structure of lightweight bones and feathers. Although feathers are only part of the avian flight plan, they are what makes a bird a bird. Feathers and wings are potent symbols in myth and legend. Put wings on a mythical creature and it gains even more power. Put feathers on yourself and you too can emulate the prowess of the bird. Feathers were especially prized by Native Americans and were worn by warriors to signify an enemy's defeat. For ancient Egyptians, the feather's light weight was the test of heaven. The gods were said to weigh the heart of the recently departed. Only if it was as light as a feather could the soul pass into the afterlife. Would-be birdmen seized on the feather as the key to flight. Their wings were covered in feathers, but not from hens. As the saying went, the hen prefers the dung heap to the skies. Any attempt to fly on chicken feathers was surely doomed. Wings like a bat, the wings of the devil himself were also out of the question. The question remained, how could a human get off the ground? Leonardo da Vinci, the brilliant Renaissance artist and thinker, designed a human-powered flying machine, the Ornithopter. But da Vinci had missed the essential fact. Humans are built to walk, while birds are built not to walk, but to fly. Birds are living airplanes. Put a bird in front of a powerful fan, and it could lift off, even while standing still. In fact, some birds do launch themselves into flight by facing into a brisk wind and simply stretching their wings. Gliders operate on the same principle. It works because of the shape of the wing, a shape that is essential to all flight. As air approaches the wing, some goes over the top and some underneath. But the air passing over the longer upper surface has to go faster than the air under the wing. Where air travels faster, pressure is reduced. So the higher pressure beneath the wing pushes it up. It's known as lift. It also works across a curve of paper. The curve is the key. Some wings are short and stubby for quick twists and turns. Others are narrow and pointed for high-speed flight. There are long, wide wings for soaring. And long, narrow wings for long-distance gliding. Four variations on one simple theme. For birds and planes, wings are the key to flight. But every flying machine has to generate airspeed across the wing. Birds can do it just by getting in a flap. How could people do the same? 200 years after Leonardo, Giovanni Borelli, another Italian thinker, came to the conclusion that human chest muscles were just too small in proportion to the body to propel us forward. Most birds need not wait for a stiff wind in order to fly. Their chest muscles can push against the air again and again. With the rush of air comes lift. For a human body to fly on its own, it would need the thigh muscles of a bodybuilder transferred to the chest. 
the slim legs of a 10-year-old and the wingspan of a light aircraft. A century after Borelli pointed out the shortfalls of human anatomy, would-be flyers were still taking some long falls. One French nobleman succeeded in flying only straight down into the River Seine. Better, perhaps, to try some hot air to launch a flight of fancy. In the 1780s, two Frenchmen, the Montgolfier brothers of Paris, experimented with a balloon made of paper and buttons, inflated by hot air. But for the maiden flight, they weren't willing to risk their own necks. The world's first air passengers were three farm animals. And when they landed safely two miles from the launch site, ballooning could take off. It was soon the Parisian social climbers' favorite means of ascent. The wealthy vied to set new records. Two men even crossed the English Channel, but they had to throw their clothes overboard to save weight and landed in their underwear. For an entire century, balloons were the only way to fly, unless you were a bird. At the age of just four weeks, a dove's chest muscles are so well developed that it can begin to take to the air. One of the highest flyers is the vulture. It can fly as high as a jumbo jet. For sheer stamina, the common swift holds the record. It stays aloft for up to four years, eating, mating, and even sleeping on the wing. Common birds like the starling fly at up to 35 miles per hour. While a peregrine falcon easily doubles that in a dive. Speed isn't everything. The goldfinch can slow to a virtual walk, yet remain airborne without stalling. But the dream of human flight did stall, often. Contraptions like the aerial steam carriage might have flown with something lighter than a steam engine to power them. One English inventor used his coachman as a test pilot. The driver was apparently a reluctant aviator. George Cayley's glider flew the length of a field. But after it crash landed, the coachman quit. Some animals use a controlled glide, not to gain altitude, but for getting down fast. For a bird, gliding is an energy-saving device. It requires only 1 20th of the energy needed for flapping, but it also makes for a slower trip. And for human gliders, speed is not the point. It is the spectacular views. A glider took aviation a few steps forward at the end of the 19th century. A young German, Otto Lilienthal, became the world's first true aviator, launching himself into more than 2,000 successful flights. He was on the brink of building a motorized glider when he died from injuries in a crash. The two inventors who would fulfill his vision were brothers, bicycle builders from America. The Wright brothers' passion for flight soars across the pages of Wilbur's diary. Man has only to watch the flight of birds to feel the weight of his earthly imprisonment. Wilbur and Orville needed propellers, like spinning wings, to drive the plane forward. A light airframe and a lightweight motor, and how to connect the power to the propeller. The bicycle builders used bicycle chains. When their plane flew one historic day in 1903, the Wrights had made one of the greatest human achievements ever. Yet if it had been alongside a jumbo jet, its landing point would have been roughly at row 22 
and it would not have even reached the height of the jet's wing. Its speed was just 6% of the fastest birds. That the Wright brothers had proved powered flight was possible. It had taken them five years. A dove flies perfectly at five weeks. The fixed wing of an airplane is a primitive invention compared to nature's designs. A bird has wings that can twist and turn, enabling it to maneuver in flight. It can recover from errors, slow without stalling, swoop and dive. An eagle uses its wingtip feathers to change the airflow over the wing. An airplane needs mechanical flaps. All birds can adjust the angle of their wings to allow them to slow down safely. An airplane's edge slats do the same job, providing a smooth, controlled landing instead of a crash. A bird's tail feathers help control speed and direction. A plane's rudder does the same. By 1917, airplanes had the beginnings of such refinements. No wonder more primitive contraptions hadn't gotten off the ground. The marvel of flight soon became a means of destruction, with ingenuity propelled by war. Nearly a century ago, a Dutchman, Anthony Folker, invented a machine gun that could fire between the blades of a spinning propeller. Design innovations pushed the airplane's maximum altitude from the height of the Great Pyramid at Giza to 40 times as high in only four years. But the reality of human flight had still not convinced the world at large. For many years, the U.S. Patent Office refused to accept patents for heavier-than-air flying machines. It claimed such devices were physically impossible. Perhaps the Patent Office had failed to notice that nature's own flying machines are heavier than air, even in the featherweight world of insects, ladybugs with rounded wing covers for rapid liftoff. Dragonflies with their two pairs of wings. And mosquitoes, each beating its wings more than 500 times per second. One insect has a name that says it all, the fly. The ultimate and most elusive aerial acrobat can even make a cartwheel landing and right itself from upside down. Insects seem perfectly engineered for flight and many of their abilities are still barely understood. Bees seem to defy the laws of physics, their tiny wings lifting such a large body weight. It's thought that minute holes in the wings might help create extra lift. Inspired by a world of such perfectly engineered flyers, aviation eventually copied nature's ability to take itself for a spin. A helicopter would take off from an idea being toyed with as far back as the 15th century. Four centuries later, and spinning wings provided lift for a helicopter in a first low altitude flight, roughly knee high. Meanwhile, a Spaniard, Juan de la Sierra, was in search of something safer than an airplane when he designed the autogyro. Instead of fixed wings, it had a free spinning rotor to supply lift, while a motor provided forward thrust. In an emergency, the free spinning rotor enabled the autogyro to drift to the ground in safety. But there was still room at the top for the modern helicopter. With power-driven rotors, it can shoot straight up into the sky and hover. The spinning blades can be separately angled to supply lift, and the whole assembly tilted to fly forward or backwards or to turn. A small tail rotor keeps the helicopter from whirling around. 
the main rotor combines wings, flaps, and rudder all in one mechanism. The helicopter has become the most versatile flying machine humans have yet designed. Early fixed wing flight remained exhilarating, partly thanks to the open cockpit. More than a few intrepid flyers took thrill-seeking to new heights. But flying takes tremendous skill. A pilot must control three types of motion, pitch, roll, and yaw, all the while keeping the airplane on course. Birds are masters of navigation. Human pilots had no natural magnetic compasses, no migratory memories to follow. Even crude instruments were lifesavers. The sighting string helped orient early aviators to the horizon. But in darkness or bad weather, without a visible horizon, a pilot soon became completely disoriented. Only the invention of the gyroscopic artificial horizon could solve that problem. Pilots needed all the help they could get, often flying on a wing and a prayer. Some carried a medallion of St. Joseph of Cupertino, patron saint to flight. But of the first 40 airmail pilots in the United States, 31 were killed. Charles Lindbergh, was one of the survivors. His epic solo flight across the Atlantic fired the public's fervor for flying, setting the pace for other aviators. Almost as soon as planes were invented, people started inventing ways to jump out of them. They weren't the first to hurl themselves into the air. The first parachute has jumped from a balloon in 1797 and brought on the first recorded case of air sickness. Passengers had to be made more comfortable in the glamorous new era of air travel. Rickety wicker chairs gave way to upholstered seats for the cushy new experience of dining in the sky. The technology of flight continued to mirror the world of nature as found in the air and under the sea. One ocean dweller is nature's version of a momentous human invention, the jet engine. A squid squeezes a jet of water out of an internal nozzle to push against the sea and travel forward. A jet engine pushes air against a sea of air and takes in more than a person breathes in 20 years just to reach cruising altitude. And there's another price to pay for such power. Early jet engines during takeoff were as loud as one very large crowd shouting in unison, a crowd the size of the Earth's entire population. Newer engines keep it down to a dull roar, only as loud as the population of New York shouting at once. Jet travel has shrunk the world. By sailing ship, transatlantic travel took many weeks, just one way. By steamship, it was anything from a five to 14 day voyage. By airship, two and a half days. An early passenger plane, 29 hours. And by 1976, just three hours in the supersonic Concorde, 300 times faster than the sailing ship. To fly much faster, we may need to leave the Earth's atmosphere in a new aircraft, part jet, part rocket. Travelers could easily have breakfast in England and lunch in China, but they'd need to get hungry fast since they'd get there in 45 minutes. Time and distance have changed. We crisscross the skies by the millions. A major city like London has an average of 3,000 passengers overhead at any given moment. Keeping them safe means using one of nature's oldest tricks. For 50 million years, bats have used the same principle as radar to fly blind, avoiding collisions even as they hunt. 
For aircraft, radar means both C and B seen. Flight controllers use it to track each plane, while pilots use it to find their way in clouds and after dark. But even with our sophisticated inventions, can we match these acrobatics? Our envy shows in the names of our aircraft. The Hawk, Mosquito, Eagle, Tiger Moth, Falcon. Each name pays tribute to an animal's astounding skills. The jump jet flies in much the same way as a grasshopper. While a stealth bomber resembles a bat, fast and virtually invisible. Inspired by the birds, bats and insects, humans have learned to use the air to their purposes. We have pushed the limits of speed and endurance, testing the durability of the human body itself. And we have claimed the elusive prize of human flight using only human power. Nearly five centuries after Leonardo's ornithopter, in 1988, the Daedalus Project, named for that would-be flyer of legend, had perfected a kind of flying bicycle. Its speed was slower than a monarch butterfly, but it went the distance from the Greek island of Crete to its neighbor, Santorini. The age-old dream had come true. The rewards of powered flight have been great. Some features can only be seen from the air, such as mysterious patterns carved on the Earth's surface or the distinctive shape of a coral island. In the words of the aviator Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, our sight has been sharpened. The airplane has revealed to us the true face of the Earth. But for efficiency, stamina, and sheer beauty, the planet's greatest aviators remain nature's own masters of flight. <laughs>